Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Certified Forgotten. I am, as always, one half of your Matt hosts. I'm Matt Monocle. I feel like I've gotten this down to such a rhythm that I can just, it's word for word. I'm not even, I don't have it written down. I'm not prepping off a screen. It's just like the same introduction time in and time out, which uh, I think is a good thing, Donato, because I think that that means that our podcast has survived and thrived long enough for me to fall into a rhythm with the introductions. What do you say? I never plan anything. Uh, and I that, always laugh. I always yes. laugh when you say, as always, I'm Matt Monogle, because I'm waiting for the time. It's not always you for some reason. When, when is that ever going to be that it's not a Matt Monogle? <laughs> like, we know it's you. You're the co-host. That's true. One of, the, one of these days it will be like the intro will be Tyler McIntyre and he'll just like have replaced me on an episode and the two of you will never, ever talk about it. It'll We're just gonna... be like, yep, yep. That's what you'll do. You'll just you'll just roll through the entire episode and only like the diehards will understand. That's going to be how Tyler becomes co-host for a day. It's going to be a bit where mm-hmm. he killed you. Finally, the, the feud is yep. over and he has murdered you. <laughs> Well, but for the time being, fuck it, I'm still alive. I am still here, and I am still excited to talk to this week's guest. Who do we have, Donato? This week, we are bringing a new friend, and I say new friend because we both had the pleasure of going to the Brooklyn Horror Festival, which I'm sure we will talk about on our bumper this or this week or next week, whenever, whatever bumper we add it as. But uh, yeah, we met some really cool people, and uh, this particular individual especially, uh, the minute we started talking, I was like, well, let's get this person on the show. And you know them as Tori Potenza, writer of Movie John and co-host of the Killer Bees podcast. Tori, welcome. Hello. It's so nice to be on the show. And it was such a pleasure meeting you both in person a couple weeks ago. So this is great that we get to do this. So normally we start by talking about your earliest horror memories, but I kind of want to start by talking about your most recent horror memories. How was the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival for you? What did you watch? What are the things that folks should be looking out for over the next couple of months? Yeah, it was great. It was it was the first in pe- in person festival I have been to since like pre COVID, and it's the mm-hmm. first one I traveled to. So, um, you know, I'm in Philly, so it wasn't like that much of a travel, but still, it was like nice to like go and do the thing and like not just have to like go home at the end of the night. Um, but yeah, I mean, like from day one, I met really awesome people and um, got to see a lot of awesome things, including your live show, and I got to see Jack Be Nimble, which was a crazy movie that I probably Mm -hmm. wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, But yeah, things I saw that I really liked. um, I really liked to Sarah a lot. Um, Give me an A. I also thought was really great, which is the uh, horror anthology. That's all reactions to Roe v. Wade. So that was really impactful with everything going on. Um, But really, I think like the, the standout things I saw were the um, horror block, the shorts blocks. Um, Mm -hmm. I think you were at the queer horror one too, um, that had uh, hideous, and I still cannot stop thinking about Hideous. That was just so incredible. Um, yeah. That is going to be, I think I ruined, not ruined. I think I, wonderful things happened to my Spotify end of your wrap up after I saw Hideous because I have <laughs> not been able to stop listening to that album. It is like the best, like I'm driving or I'm working and I'm just like, you know, I want to just like listen to some melancholic horror fueled, like queer identity crisis pop. And it's perfect. It's perfect. It's such a good album. If you haven't, if you're listening and you haven't checked out the album Hideous, you really, really should. It's amazing. Which also happened to me when I saw that director's other film, Knife and Heart, because that's all the music is from M83 and it's amazing. So it's, he just is, he's one of those directors that is so good with picking out music. And that is Mm. something that is very important to me in movies. You mentioned traveling for the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival. I'm actually, I'm curious because... I don't feel like I have a great sense of what the festival scene is like in Philly. I know you guys have exhumed, correct? Isn't that one of the more more like a night of movies than it is like a proper festival, though, correct? Yeah, Exhumed is great. Um, When I first moved to Philly, that was like really one of my like gateways into the movie scene here Um, because I had a friend that went to the 24 hour horror movie marathon every year. Uh, So I got to go with her a couple times. I've only actually made it through the whole 24 hours twice, Mm. uh, but I've been like four or five times. Um, But they also like do tons of programming because they're just a bunch of dudes that collect like 35 millimeter reels. Um, So we get to see like incredible things on film. Um, They also do a lot of programming at the Mahoning Drive-In, which is in the Poconos, which is like about an hour, hour and a half outside of Philly. Um, so we went to like a car exploitation uh, marathon this summer nice. and we got to see The Hitcher, which I had never seen on the big screen. And that was amazing. Nice. So um, I feel like there is like a good community there. Um, and actually like for my birthday, like a week or so ago, um, Philomoca, which is this venue host, who hosts some Exhumed stuff, just did a, um, 
a pop-up like video store rental like shop. Uh, it's called Crypt Video Rentals and they're doing it in random places. I think there's one in New York coming up next year, but they just have VHSs for sale and all of these collectors that like were just selling VHSs. So uh, for the nerdy perspective that like loves weird niche genre horror, it's really great. But we also have the Philadelphia Film Festival, which has a lot of great stuff. Um, I've seen some really good horror movies there specifically. Um, and we also have Puff, which is the Philadelphia Unnamed Film Festival, which does a lot of good indie stuff. I haven't actually been to Puff yet, but um, Movie John covers it a lot. So we we do a lot of things with Puff. For its A plus name for your cinema. Like Puff is such a good yeah. name for a film festival. Like <laughs> No notes on that, then I'll go ahead. No, I said I want to get out to Exhumed uh, because... I believe that is what Mr. James Shapiro, Patreon and friend of the podcast, was talking about this weekend when I got to see him. And he's like, I went to Philly for a 24 hour uh, film festival that was all 35 millimeters. So that's definitely what he was talking about. And then he was telling me like the concoction that he uses to stay awake because he's like, yeah, of course, like oh, he, he's he's been in the industry uh, as, as a veteran, let's say. And he's done many of these things. So like I trust that his concoction works for him. But I was just like, I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I could do a full 24 hours. No. It's rough, but they also do such a good job of programming it where, like, you watch the more normal movies, like, as it starts, because it starts at noon, and then when you get to, like, the 1, 2 a.m. movies, everyone's, like, really sleepy and maybe kind of fucked up, and so then everything just feels like a fever dream for this weird block in the morning. Um, so there are some movies that live in my head specifically as something where I'm like, did I dream that? Or was that a thing I actually saw? Um, but yeah, they also host it now at in a Phoenixville at the Colonial Theater, which is where like um, in the blob, there's a scene where the blob comes out and everyone runs out of the theater. And so that is the like historic theater. Um, and they host Blob Fest there every year, which is really cool. So. That's awesome. Philly, you know, I lived in New York for six years and I was just taught that Philly is like, you know, the the ugly little brother, ugly step cousin of like New York City. Philly's cool as hell. I've been there a few times now. Like it's one of the coolest cities I've ever been to. Like arts and culture and the downtown is really cool. Uh, Philly gets a bad rap. And I don't I know I don't need to convince you of that, Tori, but it's just sort yeah. of like if you haven't been to Philly, you should really fucking go to Philly. It's cool <laughs> shit. When I first moved to Philly, my mom would just send me articles about how terrible Philly was. Like, mm. she sent me one that was, like, like top ten cities with the ugliest people. And then she was like, Philly's number five. And I was like, what the fuck are you trying to say? Come on. But it was always stuff like that. And I'm like, you just have to come here. And now that she's been here a couple times, there's, like, a good movie scene. There's a really good mm. food scene. It's, yeah, it's a good city, even though there's, you know, it's a little rough around the edges, which is probably why it gets a bad rap. Does yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think out loud. Does Philly have a namesake uh, horror film? Because like I think about Jersey and like Jersey has everything from Friday the Thirteenth to like Uncle Peckerhead recently, and like those mm-hmm. are like Jersey films. I'm trying to think if Philly, if there's like a Philly horror standout. I don't know if like Philly specifically, but like surrounding areas, there's a lot of George Romero um, right. and then M. Night Shyamalan yeah. too, um, which Shyamalan does do some stuff in Philly. I've been like walking past some places where like randomly they're like, oh, there's like an M. Night movie shooting here. Um, but yeah, I feel like it might be more like the the burbs like burbs. around it, like Pitts- it. Pittsburgh-y kind of mm. area. Yeah. Yeah, the internet is not particularly uh, optimistic about there being good horror films with a strong Philly tie, but I'm sure there's got to be some found footage stuff. Donato, you would know better than me. Something needs to be about killer cheesesteaks. More, <laughs> more culinary horror, yes. please. The war we between... Need, we need a gritty horror movie, I think, personally. Yes. Gritty is a horror movie. Gritty is like yeah. a, is a mixed media live action horror film that is like yes. happening wherever he happens to be at that moment. I love that. Uh, okay, thank you for indulging my film festival and Philly questions. Now I want to back all the way up and talk about your earliest memories and your earliest days as a horror fan. We always like to talk to our guests about how they first encountered the genre and started to fall in love with it. And I I have a feeling uh, that your story is probably going to be pretty good because you you eat, drink, and sleep this stuff. So. Uh, I feel like my story is a little weird because I've been a scaredy cat most of my life. So I didn't really get into horror until like my 20s. Um, nice. I feel like my first horror memory was when my parents accidentally taped over my Peter Rabbit VHS with Night of the Lepus, which is about killer rabbits. And so that really scarred me for a really long period of time. Um, <laughs> but my birthday is like right around Halloween. My parents like to go. My parents used to like to go to horror movies when they were dating 
thing. And so they saw stuff like The Fly. And I even remember when they saw uh, Blair Witch for the first time, because that was such a cultural phenomenon when I was growing up. Um, so I always liked creepy Halloween stuff. And I was really into serial killers when I was in high school. So I liked more thrillers. Um, so like maybe Hitchcock was like kind of a gateway, but mm. I, it actually wasn't until I moved to Philly in my early 20s and I was like mostly alone all of the time and my anxiety made it, it so that I just didn't want to go out and try to meet people. So I just sat home and watched horror movies all the time. Um, and two of the big ones for me were both like body horror movies that are incredibly different. Um, John Carpenter's The Thing and then Reanimator. Um, and those were two that stood out to me that like, I think kind of changed my thinking about what horror movies could be. Um, like reanimator is just so fun and weird and Combs is so amazing and campy in that movie. Um, but then the thing just like really resonated with me and kind of like gave me this out of body experience of like not having to deal with my own anxiety and dealing with like other people's anxiety. So there was even like a weird mental health aspect where I was like, Oh, I think horror is actually like beneficial in helping mm -hmm. me get out of my brain. I've had to explain to multiple people, especially around the holidays. I feel like folks are like, Oh, you're a film critic. So like, let's talk about why you love horror so much. And I've had to explain to, to multiple people that the, that the way that anxiety manifests for me is the same experience I get when I watch horror that I really love. Mm. And I have no interest in unpacking that. That doesn't seem healthy, <laughs> but like, I do not want to ruin that experience. Like I just like being tense and I also don't want to be tense anymore, but there's something about the tension of horror films and the like the tightness and like the way that that makes you feel when you're going through it. I don't know. It's just like, it, it's therapeutic in, in a way mm. that I probably will never fully be able to understand or articulate. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I feel like it's like, oh, if I'm super anxious and stressed out about a social interaction I have to have tomorrow afternoon that I'm already thinking about, I can watch someone be really stressed out about like a serial killer that's after them. And then I'm like, oh, cool, that's a much more legit thing to be scared about. So I can just like forget about my problem, at least for an hour and a half, and I'm good. We were having, Donato was actually leading a discussion in the Certified Forgotten Slack this past week about the um, the thing prequel. So I have to ask, since you mentioned that as a formative film for you, are you pro or anti the thing prequel? I actually haven't seen it yet. Uh, and I probably should. Um, I actually think we will because I have, uh, someone just reached out and said they'd really love to do Mary Elizabeth Winstead on killer bees. And I was like, would she be good for killer bees? And then I looked her up and I was like, Oh fuck. She actually is a low key yep. B movie queen. So we should definitely do that. So I probably will watch it soon. Um, I, I do kind of know, like, the, not the twist, but like the ending of the movie and how it relates to John Carpenter's The Thing. And I do think that's an interesting idea. Um, but I know for me, the thing that I love so much is the practical effects. Like I, mm -hmm. after watching it, just watching like uh, Rob Bottin talk about how he was able to like do a lot of like the really big practical effects. And so that's the thing that really got me into it. And so I'm interested in how the look is comparatively in that regard. <laughs> so like, I mean, I defend the prequel to an extent mm -hmm. because I do think and Mary Elizabeth Winstead kicks ass in that role. There's so much to it. That is just like you're watching the thing again, but in a prequel sense, the one mistake they make and the biggest mistake, obviously, if you're going to follow the thing is to use CG. And what's even worse is they use CG, but it was a decision made after the practical was done already. And then they released the footage of the practical online to show everyone like this was our first intention, but the studio wanted us to do CG over it. And it's like, don't even show me at that point. Like, fuck you. Like it made me it retroactively made me dislike the movie more. But even with that and acknowledging, you know, the CG ness of it all and you're following one of the best practical horror movies of all time with CG is worth it. I defend it. OK, that's that's good to know. That does hurt a little bit that yeah. they use practical that they didn't use, but I will try to forget that fact and go into it blind. Even worse, that they erased means... it. They, they straight up erased it. They did not use oh. it. They just straight up were like, yeah, what if we just put CG over it? Crazy. Someday somebody will there there will be a there will be a, a remaster or a director's cut of that someday. It's just like the audience is too big. The the material is already there. It's you know, you you could move a million units of a Blu-ray or a 4K just by basically being like, yeah, we un-CGI'd the film. Now pay me forty dollars for this on 4K and we'd all be like, yep, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> yes, well, absolutely. So I have the next question then because I want to play off of the fact that you said you have a weird origin 
but you you have my origin like almost word oh. beat for beat word for word uh again anxiety riddled as a child very scared of everything i eventually used horror to get over it and again one of the first movies and one of my favorites still is reanimator for me so cluing on the reanimator itself and like obviously the reasons why we love it but for me i i gravitated towards horror comedies as a beginner horror fan to say and to be like well this is an easy entry point because i can laugh at horror it can become this thing that is comforting and can be very entertaining so like did the comedy aspect like help you did it bring you in is that like was that a gateway of sorts yeah i think so because when i saw reanimator i feel like it was the first time where i was like oh horror can be fun and i i feel like now that i've been a horror fan for like several years i understand that being scared is also fun and that is part of the experience but seeing something where i wasn't necessarily scared but at times i was grossed out and also also i have a huge crush on jeffrey combs in that movie so i'm just like utterly charmed by him and his weirdo like thing that he is doing um So I think, yeah, the fact that it was fun and just weird, and there are so many good one-liners in that movie, too, that, like, I still cackle when I watch that movie, even though I've seen it, like, a hundred times at this point. Um, And so I feel like in horror comedies, I do have a soft spot, even though I feel like other subgenres have kind of started in later years, like, gravitating towards more. But I feel like I always come back to that as just, like, a comfort area. Um, And my sister, who just turned 11, uh, she came and stayed, and I was like, oh, we got to show you horror movies because she's into horror and so we had a whole like plethora of stuff that we could offer her um and she doesn't really get horror comedies we tried to show her trick-or-treat and she was just like oh that was cool i like sam but i wasn't scared at all uh and i was like oh okay so you don't you don't get it yet but like someday you're gonna get that like this is like why horror can be really fun sometimes I don't know, man. Your sister sounds correct to me as the, the <laughs> curmudgeon who also does not really like very many horror comedies. I can un- I can understand why she might feel that way. Well, talk to me a little bit about uh, your evolution into a writer, because I think there's a lot of people that like they will become really big fans and they'll be like, oh, I love this. I'm going to like I'm going to watch everything I can. I'm going to rent everything I can. I might purchase everything that I can. And that's kind of where that process stops for them. So what was it about your experience of the horror genre that made you think like, I've, I've got some stuff that I want to say about this and I'm going to either myself or at a venue find a place to, to start jotting down some of some of my film criticism thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I come from I come from like a history research background. And so I'm just like a really big like research nerd and I love to read and stuff. And so after I graduated with my master's, I, I'm someone that like weirdly loves being in school all the time. I feel like it gives me purpose. Like I like mm-hmm. having homework that I know I need to do. I It's terribly nerdy, but um, that's, and I just kind of felt like listless and I didn't know what to do with myself. And so I needed to like have projects. And so I tried to, for a little while, just have like my own blog where I did like horror movie double features and just tried to pick like really good pairings of movies that I thought like fit well together and then kind of like dropped it. Um, and then met the people that ran uh, Cinema 76 and Movie John, who eventually combined to become Movie John. Um, And one day my friend Ryan was like, you know, you could like write and pitch for us if you wanted to. And I was like, what? I just watch movies. Like, what do you mean? And then I was like, oh, wait, this actually fills that gap of like me needing like to write and do all of this research and look into things. Um, And so the first piece I pitched was for Women in Horror Month. And I wrote a piece on Barbara Crampton because I love her for reanimation. And then finding out later on that she like kind of left the industry because she was like aging out and didn't have roles and then found a loving embrace and independent horror because so many people loved her. And now she is someone that is like a big advocate for working with like indie cinema and horror specifically. And so I was like, oh, she's like a really important person I want to write about. Uh, But that was just a one off. Um, And then I watched Videodrome for the first time and Cronenberg was a person I did not think that I could watch. Uh, I felt like he was always like too intense. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I remember watching like I Love the 80s and seeing like clips of The Fly and being like, that looks disgusting. There is no way I can ever watch that movie. Um, But then I saw Videodrome and I realized that there was this guy that had a lot of anxieties about like technology and the future and um, how technology like can have like physical manifestations in the body and like all of this weird philosophical shit that I've always been interested in. And I felt like 
he was someone that was like a kindred spirit and that I could write about. So then I ended up pitching my Cronenberg on sex and gender column, which is like the thing that really like got me into to writing. And now I'm like very loosely starting to put my thoughts together in like a book around that subject. But that that's a bigger project for down the road. Yeah, uh, that's intense. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, he's my guy. So he he got me here. <laughs> So what do you find, I mean, when you're kind of looking at it, you mentioned you come at, at film through like a, a, a research background and um, as somebody who got their MA in film studies, I, I like I, the grad school thing is great. It's, it's not just structure. It's like, it's the only place where you feel like you have time carved out to really just like look up shit that is interesting to you because you want to do it. I miss those days dearly, even though they weren't that long ago. So I'm kind of curious what you, what your approach is to, to film criticism, because I think there are people that come to it from a cultural lens. I think there's people that come to it from, you know, the mechanics and craftsmanship of filmmaking. And I'm always, I'm always interested because every writer who sticks around for a little bit eventually gravitate towards the thing where their voice is the best, right? Like where they have the most to say, the niche that they get to occupy. And I'm curious kind of like how you found that niche for yourself and kind of like what, how your research background helped that. Did you, you know, were you every, I feel like everybody starts by kind of like writing what they see other people doing and it doesn't feel great. And eventually you like land where you want to go. Was there a self-discovery process in writing or were you like, this is me, I got it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's still something I'm figuring out even now. Cause I, even though I feel like I've been writing forever, it's only been like three plus years that I've been like consistently writing. Hmm. Um, And actually, when we were at Brooklyn Horror, I know there was one night I was asking Donato for writing tips because like I feel like reviews specifically are one of my weak points. And that's something that I've been like really working on um, within the last like year or so is like really trying to hone in on my voice with uh, reviews specifically. And so I feel like more of like the loose academic, I can just like throw a bunch of weird ideas I have into a piece kind of writing is like really my thing. I love just being like, oh, here's this weird fucking thing that I'm like really obsessed with. About. Now I'm just going to go into detail about it. And reviews are so hard because you want to give enough detail, but not like too much to like totally mm-hmm. ruin and spoil the movie for someone. Um, and so with my like background, I think what you said really rings true where every class I took in my grad program, I just got to be like, oh, this is a thing I've always wanted to research that now I just can research for this class. Um, and a lot of it was specifically women's studies and um, my uh what's it called? Capstone Project ended up being a exhibit on the history of women and mental health care in the United States, uh, Mm. which is a very dark history. Um, And so specifically like women's history, but also like mental health, mental illness, and that also just being something I've struggled with uh, for a few years too, um, all kind of grappled on to me as like themes that I really loved. And horror is a great place for exploring a lot of those themes. Um, And then also like kind of, um, you know, eventually coming out and like recognizing and bi and queer and all of these things. I felt like there was like such a home for just like the specific weirdo I felt like. (laughs) So like, you know, indie horror, queer horror, like women, especially like Cure Le Genice, where it's like kind of focusing on like mad women and irredeemable women, which I feel like we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Those those kind of themes are are something I really love uh, specifically when I'm writing. Um, And then like using that to also just talk about like sex and gender, I think are just interesting in in general to talk about within film. And I see that especially with like a lot of male filmmakers, because there is like a lot of like just embedded misogyny and things. And so like unpacking a lot of those themes is really interesting for me. I have to ask you, Donato, uh, what is your secret sauce to writing (laughs) the perfect review? Or if not the perfect review, then eight reviews in three days. Uh, Minimal amount of time to think about your thoughts and just regret and just... (laughs) spitting it out and no that's not the actual but like first pass best pass is that what you're saying well, like that's the funny <laughs> thing that i do say out loud sometimes it's like you know take your time with the review because I, I recently i wrote about barbarian and i got to see that a month before the embargo and my thoughts on barbarian immediately after the movie versus the review i ended up with th- three weeks later mm. to meet embargo of course was very different like i i went from basically lukewarm to thinking about it more to sitting with it to like loving barbarian 
But then again, there are so many festival movies, uh, like I was saying before, where you see the movie, you have to get the review out ASAP. You have to like find an outlet near the bar and sit there and you will have like 45 <laughs> minutes to get that review done. Those are some of the best reviews I've ever written going back and reading them. Um, because I, I think there is a lot to say about having confidence in your voice, as you said, Monogle, like finding your voice is so important. Uh, but having confidence in what you say. And I think like uh, Tori, correct me if I'm wrong, but like one of the things we were kind of talking about a little bit was when I was an early writer, I was always like write in first person when you're doing a review because it's a review for you. So like I, Matt Donato, think this. So in my review would be like, well, I think the movie did this. I think the movie did that. But the more and more I got into, you know, reading other writers and the more I think Matt Patches like tweeted out early in my career and he's just like, hey, baby writers, stop saying I think in your reviews. Everyone knows about it. It's your review. Have confidence, have an opinion and make that your stance. And like that helped me so much hearing that because I immediately was like, this is my review and I should be confident about it because if you're reading my review of something, you know who I am already. You know what my stance is probably going to be and like. I'm going to make it with emphasis. So that has been some of the best, you know, ways I've gone about it. But like, I, I, what is the perfect formula? I don't know. It's chaos, minimal booze, but maybe a little bit and uh, having <laughs> a lot to say about a movie, but still having to like, you know, if the challenge is a really middling movie that I like, I'm sorry, but a lot of indie horror, sometimes it's just a okay. And you got to find 600 words in there that basically say it's fine over and over again. As long as you can do that, you got a review. Yep. Yeah, the that was very helpful advice too with the the use of I statements because I felt like that was a problem for me because I love writing so many like philosophical, like waxing poetically like pieces. And so when I sat down for reviews, I'm like, oh, I'm going to lose my voice if I don't use I statements. And then my I've finally been working on it a little bit. And my uh, editor was like, oh, this last review you did was really good. And I was like, really? I didn't use I statements. Like my voice is still there. And he's like, yeah, like you're good. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, cool. I'm figuring it out. <laughs> but reviews, I think I, I would agree with what you said, Tori. I think reviews are actually the hardest thing to write. Yeah. Because they are the thing where you, like my chaotic writing style that we talked about on the show before is like, I write down my best thought and then I write in everything else around that. So whatever my best thought is as a writer, like whether that's if I'm writing an essay and I'm talking about like the history of something or another, I write down what I feel is the best articulated point that I have in my head. And then I just go backwards and forwards from there, which means I usually start about two thirds or one third of the way into my piece, which is chaos for a lot of folks, I think. But like it, it works for me. But when you're writing reviews, a lot of the decision making about template is taken out of your hands because you know that there's like, you know, functionally, structurally, there's a lead in, there is plot synopsis, and then there's analysis. And because of that, because, you you know, writing within confines is always can, can be a lot easier. But I know there's just been something about the review process for me that like I am, I have never been comfortable. And I finally got it down to like a cadence for a couple of publications where I know my word count and I'm like, okay, I got this and I can feel it. But yeah, I, I don't know why reviews are so difficult. And I think that's just because, you know, you're not able to, for me, I'm not able to start with my best thought. Like that's not, I don't mm. get to like, I don't get to build an entire piece around the thing that I like the most because I've got to like off ramp every now and then and get back to like, I have to write a plot synopsis and plot synopsis are really hard. Like on my monitor right now, I have the one for the movie we're about to talk about. It like was pulling teeth to get it out of my head. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only person that considers themselves to be a pretty good writer that like would rather write a book <laughs> than a review. Yeah. I feel like it's weird. I've had like a weird relationship with structure. Like I had a, f a philosophy teacher who I ended up uh, being a TA for who I loved and his uh, one assignment in the class was to tell me you find out how to show me you understood like concepts in our philosophy class. I was like, so like a paper, he was like, however you want to do it. And I was like, the, the fuck, like, <laughs> like that's, I can't work without mm -hmm. like you giving me guidelines, a number, like a word count, page count, like something. Um, and so then I got kind of excited about the lack of structure as I started writing more. And then now that I try to sit down for reviews, I'm like, oh crap, there's structure here though. <laughs> and I don't want to deal with that anymore. I want to start with my best thought and just like write weird shit around that. Yeah. Well, and the one thing that I read more in, uh, I'm not even gonna say like younger critics, I'm just gonna say like more inexperienced and stuff like that. The idea of film criticism has almost like 
gotten away from some people, I would say, because when I read a film critique, it should be critiquing the film in its entirety. Like, I feel like we've gotten away from hitting on every aspect. Like sometimes I'll read a film review, but all it is is one author who had a single issue with this movie, but that single issue is going to take up five paragraphs. And then there's an outro. And I'm like, cool. You mentioned nothing about the performance. You mentioned nothing about cinematography. You mentioned nothing about the score. Like everything is just forgotten because they had a stance they wanted to make that would have made a great op-ed. And I think that's where it sometimes gets lost where like, a lot of writers think film criticism where is where it's all at. Like, that's what you got to do. But I've actually found freedom now in the idea that I'm going to write my critique and I can hit on all the things that make it a film critique. And then I can pull one of those ideas out that maybe I want to go really hard into. And that becomes an op-ed I can sell elsewhere. Like, there needs to be more of a, an establishment of, like, this is film criticism and this is op-eds. Um, and I feel like that's where a lot of that structure comes in for film criticism because – God bless you, Monocle. You said working backward, and I cannot do that. I am full forward momentum where I have my first opening paragraph, I got my meat, and I got my closing. I know how each one of those is going to flow in my head. So, like, it is just start to finish. I'm just going straight through it. But, like, that's that's how I work. That's the thing. It just all comes out and right in a row. And that's how I think I found my voice to say. Like, I found my template that works for me. And my voice is the way that I'm always moving forward, and everything connects. Like, that's just how I've done it my entire life career it's you want to say. So it's so much fun to write a really good paragraph and be like fuck yeah that was a really good paragraph and be like is, <laughs> does this come at the beginning or the end i literally have no clue where this fits in yeah. the flow of the structure but you're like and then you're like, it out. crap does it fit i'm like i wrote a great paragraph that now doesn't fit with anything else yep. god damn it <laughs> every now and then you have to delete it and you're like why god why do i write this way no 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 you don't delete it then you have a different start to a new piece you can sell for That's even true. more money that is where that's we need to true. get better about. <laughs> Donata, uh, Daddy Donato will teach us how to double dip. I think that's <laughs> that's great. I'm into that. Also, wait, last thing. And I, just want your, I want your opinions on this because the last piece of information on a review that I saw someone tweet out, I believe it was Matt Singer. I don't know if I'm correct. I apologize if it wasn't, but it was a more prominent critic in the scene. And he said that there should be no plot synopsis in a film review. Discuss. Weird disagree but only in the sense that you are not uh, no plot synopsis would work for us and people like us but you should never write a film review we all do it but you should never write a film review for other film critics you Mm -hmm. my personal bias and opinion is like you should always write a review and i write for like an alt weekly here in austin right that's where the, the majority of my reviews are published so like i have no idea who's reading my, like it's available in every store in Austin. And so somebody, you know, somebody might read the review and, and whatever, but I've always been a big education guy. And so I think you write your reviews for people that that might be the only review they read that year or, or that month or anything like that. And I think for that, you can't assume a level of understanding about a movie that f- foregoes a plot synopsis. I don't think it's a bad idea. And I think that if that's how you write regularly, I think that you can really make that work for you. But I'm always going to err on the side of like, you know, would would my mom's cousin read this and feel like they're prepared? They, they know whether or not this is a movie for them. That's my outcome. I think I agree with you, too. Like, I, I remember in college having this really, like, great teacher that was teaching a forensics class, but he was, like, an expert in his field, and he did not how to, like bring that down to a 101 level where like a person like me that has never been in the field of forensics to just understand what he is talking about. And so I think it's the same thing where I'm like, oh, when I'm writing, I have no idea who my audience is or if they even understand this. I know like sometimes my family likes to support me and read these things. And I don't Mm -hmm. think they know the synopsis to a lot of the weird indie movies that I am typically writing about. So I feel like I, and I also use that as like an anchor to help me figure out even like what I am going to talk about, like in the piece itself or what parts I really hone in on as some of like the major themes or plot points of the film. So I think, I don't know, I I feel like it's important for me, but also probably for my audience too. Yeah, Yeah, I think the idea is just don't waste words on something that is just regurgitation when you can Mm. make make your points stick harder with like your own train of thought. And I, I writing for IGN, they're very much no plot if you can do it like if you do one or two huh. sentences that's fine so mm-hmm. like i've actually had to ad- adapt that a little bit and it's it's been very interesting because usually my second paragraph is always 
just like, here's the recap of the plot. But I've gotten more into like, here's a recap of the plot very briefly with still my take on it. So like, yeah, it's, it's just been, again, to anyone listening to this, if you want to be a film critic or you're working at being a film critic, whatever works for you is what works. Like, that's the thing. Finding your voice is finding exactly how you navigate this and do it best to yourself. Uh, and no matter what you do, there will be somebody else who says what you do is wrong, that there is a better way. And fuck that, because whatever works for you is the best way to do that. So by all means, please just pursue what you are doing, except if you write five paragraphs of plot synopsis and one paragraph of critique. And if you dig into weird and esoteric horror films, uh, you might just get published at Certified Forgotten. I feel like I needed to do like a little tag there at the end. Which also I can wrap around and say, speaking of weird and esoteric horror films, we are going to take the quickest of breaks. But when we come back, who shit, we got a movie. We have a movie to discuss. So we're going to be back in just a second and we're going to be talking about Helter Skelter. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to today's episode of Certified Forgotten. A quick, I don't want to say reminder, but a quick little information blurb for you about where you can follow Certified Forgotten. For some of you, the main platform that you use to ingest film criticism, as well as following entertainment sites, well, it's just not super reliable anymore, is it, Donato? No, it sucks. Enlon fucking took a good thing, and I refuse to say his name right ever again, because he's a piece of shit. (laughs) Yeah, he can't possibly search these mentions and if he does more power to him. But it does raise the question for any of your favorite publications, whether it's us or, you know, other sites that deal with horror, pop culture criticism, it's good to have sort of a reset moment and talk about the best ways to follow, support, and engage with those sites. So I will start by saying, as I always do at the end of an episode, that you can go visit certifiedforgotten.com. We publish about six articles a month. That's one a week, sometimes two a week, depending on cadence. And honestly, with that sort of a volume, you can typically just kind of go there and check it out, right? Like if you want to make sure that you're not missing any kind of content, just go to certifiedforgotten.com. We always have stuff featured up above the homepage and we have a feed right there on the page that talks about new things. That's not a terrible way to approach that. Yeah. And I think the other side of it too, is if you're listening to this podcast, we appreciate you dearly. Uh, And the other part of, you don't even have to share the podcast. Uh, An Apple review goes a huge long way. Mm -hmm. So anything like, you know, we often talk about like how can i support like is is it enough if i do x like do i have to do y to really be a good supporter and it's like no like you're listening like that's literally like that is that's all we're kind of wanting we want to listen but like if you want to support like a simple little review if you want to retweet us if you want to do stuff like that like it's the simple stuff every little bit counts and like we appreciate every bit of it yeah and we do have we have presence on other platforms uh we are maintaining a facebook page We are not maintaining an Instagram account, but we hope to be doing some stuff with that in the future because people keep following us, even though we we don't regularly update that. We've been toying with Hive uh, as a potential platform. We've got a little bit of content on there that I think, you know, um, it it might prove to be a pretty useful platform. So if you are on social media, whatever you decide to end up, if you look for Certified Forgot, uh, odds are that you will find us or a scammer that is imitating us so thoroughly that like what's the fucking difference at that point anyways like if they're producing wholesale film criticism about niche horror films then like well we flew too close to the sun that, that was meant to happen for us yeah and i mean th- at the end of the day too like you know I- i'm gonna be on twitter until it burns to the ground uh i have that privilege in a way and but like you know it, a lot of people are gonna bail off and they should because of what's happening there but we're still gonna be on twitter until right monogle mm-hmm. like we're, we're not gonna leave oh, yeah, twitter so like we're there yeah, until the end Titanic. We're, we're playing we're playing uh, hair metal right up until the very end. Yeah, but like that's it's it's just such a bummer because it's like, you know, you work so hard to kind of like build a little following and then one fucking douche nozzle can come in and ruin it. But, you know, our next episode will actually be featuring a guest that is pretty social media light, does not have a lot of social media. And I think that the the key takeaway from there is that we can still kick it old school. There are still folks that you can follow and support, and it doesn't always need to be through like one centralized feed. So whether it's us or somebody else, find the writers you like, set up Google alerts, set up RSS feeds, whatever you got. Um, and I promise you it'll be worth your effort. And on that note, back to the show. Okay, welcome back. So this week on the show, we are talking about the 2012 horror film. Horror film? 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we'll talk about it. Helter Skelter. Uh, I mentioned in the pre-roll that I worked on a synopsis, so I'm going to subject you to it word for word. Directed by acclaimed Japanese photographer Mika Ninagawa and based off a mid-90s manga of the same name, Helter Skelter delves deep into the world of beauty photography. Young model Liliko is a nationwide sensation, the cover of every magazine and a rising star in film and television. But to get to the top, Liliko has been subject to repeated and extremely illegal cosmetic surgery. Now with a young rival on the rise, Liliko is stuck between the ticking clock of youth and the addictions and violence that threaten to ruin her. Fuck yeah, plot synopses are easy. I don't know what I was complaining about earlier. That, that was killer. That was great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start by asking a pretty obvious question based on the fact that we were able to stream this movie in exactly one place, and that was archive.org. Tori, how the hell did this movie come on your radar? So I think the first time I heard about this movie was a few years ago. Um, I, my friend Amber, um, who does Horn Blood Fire podcast, um, she lived in uh, South Korea for a while. And so she was always posting these reviews on Instagram of these like awesome movies that I could not find anywhere. And mm-hmm. this was one of the ones that really stuck out. Just I, in general, the synopsis like really hit me as something like, oh, I bet I'm going to love this movie. Um, and I just couldn't find it anywhere. So I put it on the back burner. Um, and then I was looking for some really weird films in that same vein, the guinea pig movies, <laughs> uh, which are really fucked up and people probably should not watch them. But uh, I was looking for those and someone suggested the Internet Archive. And I was like, oh, fuck, I forgot the Internet Archive was a thing. I'm allowed to swear, right? I realized oh, yeah. that I've like sworn so many times. OK. <laughs> oh, God, and you're then... going to get us canceled. This show's down <laughs> and we're pulling it off iTunes. Sorry. Uh, uh... Uh... But then um, then I just like spent a day on Internet Archive going through my letterbox list of all the things that I haven't been able to find streaming anywhere. And this was one of the movies. And so I immediately put it on um, and was just so excited to finally find this movie. And it's great quality on Internet it Archive. It really is. It's very exciting. Yeah. Wild how good the, the quality of that was. Yeah. So we, this is not the first time that we've talked about. What you know, kind of like this window of like 2010 to 2020 Japanese genre, like indie films. These are Japanese cinema, especially Japanese genre cinema, tends to be a nightmare when it comes to distribution rights. So a lot of these films end up in places like the Internet Archive. God bless them. Uh, but this is, I mean, when we're talking about this film, I we, we should say at the outset that this is not like a festival darling only. Right. This is a film that was in competition for some major awards um, in 2012 when it was released. Uh, it made $24 million domestic in Japan. Uh, so this is this is a movie that was a success, like a big, it was in the top 10 um, at the box office when it was released in theaters in Japan in t- 2012. So this is a big film and it directed by one of the biggest photography stars of, of the 1990s. And it's on Internet Archive. So I think I want to I kind of want to start by talking a little bit um, since you mentioned some of the stuff, um, Tori, about like your finding things on Internet Archive and other places. Do you spend a lot of time seeking out like Asian, Southeast Asian horror film? Is that is that a genre or, or a, a, a subgenre of horror, a nationality of horror that you tend to look to? Because I know we've been kind of had an abundance of riches over the last decade. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like weird subgenres of horror that I look into. I just get into a mood and I'm like, oh, I need to watch like all of the films in this weird category. Um, but I feel like there's been a lot of um, like Asian cinema in general that I've been trying to hunt down and look up lately, um, especially like female directed stuff that I hadn't really heard of. Um, but also as a really big fan of body horror, um, there's a lot of like these like Japanese like cyberpunk films from like the 70s and 80s that are really amazing. And I've had a really hard time trying to find and all of those ha- that I was looking for happened to be on the Internet Archive. So it has been just like a weird rabbit hole that I've gone down as of late, especially in regards to like just like body horror and like techno horror, because I think those are two like very interesting things, especially when we're talking about like, I don't know, like philosophy and humanity Mm -hmm. in general. So it's like nice to see how much, especially a lot of like Japanese cinema, like deals with these like kinds of like themes in film. So the first thing that I said when I jumped into this uh, 
conversation before we started recording was I said, Donato, Reds. Talk to me about the Reds in this film. This is a film that is steeped in the fashion industry. And my God, you are going to get the best looks you've ever seen on camera. So I want to start with Donato because Reds are his thing. How are you doing, bud? There's a lot of Reds in this movie. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, my favorite color to use in any film is red. Uh, it, I think it's just fucking gorgeous because it can be used so many different ways, whether you're lighting an entire scene with a road flare or you're, again, clothing representing anger, things like that. Like red just conveys so much. And I think it's telling that the main character in this film dons tremendous amounts of red. Um, and, and so much of the imagery is p- playing against each other because like you have the main character who is kind of trying to stay atop the modeling industry and will do whatever it takes to do that. So red is representing anger and and representing like what she's willing to do fire you, however you want to go with that. But then she'll be in like a bathtub of rose petals. So red is beautiful and red is showing something else in that scene. And just the different ways that red can like symbolize themes and like show motifs. And it all looks so, so stunning. I mean, this is a gorgeous film top to bottom. I think of movies, you know, if you want to think of filmmakers like Nicholas Winding Refn with the Neon Demon and how he uses beauty and how he uses costumes and how he uses the modeling industry to show the extensiveness of just attraction, but then have cannibalistic elements in it, you know, like that's the Neon Demon. I think Helter Skelter is right there because it is chaos. It is anarchy, but it is so so gorgeous and so opulent in the way that it is attractive. It's just, you can't look away. So I, that, and that's the crazy thing to me because we talk about, uh, we did X day hair extensions on the podcast with Jenny Nolf. And that was a movie we had to buy on DVD. Uh, we brought Re- uh, Rebecca Polyon to do it comes, which is a movie that played Fantasia, I think 2018 and still hasn't even come out in the U S. So like those, exi- like these are all examples of, Helter Skelter puts like 90% of American hard to fucking shame and with how it looks like it is so stunning. And yet, once again, it is on archive.org because it couldn't get like a good distribution here or any distribution if even, you know, like it is such a goddamn tragedy how we treat international cinema um, because, you know, I, I thump this movie Tumbad all the time, an Indian horror film that I think would have won, you know, should have been in the Oscars consideration with the cinematography, how good it was but that went straight to Amazon prime and no one knows about it. And it's like, man, you really got to start looking outward. I also hate that you said it comes and I assumed it was an, it follows like porn parody. I was like, Oh, that's like nice. obviously what that movie is. <laughs> that exists somewhere. You know that, you know, that probably it also exists. Too, it's definitely right? there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned neon demon, which I think is just like, you know, uh, our, our ref and, may owe royalties to Helter Skelter. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on in here where I'm like, did you never see this? Tell, don't tell me you never saw this. I think there's also like, there's some Brian Fuller when I think of the way that he does costuming um, in his film and television shows as well. There's certainly some Aiko Ishioka, if I said that correctly, sorry, the uh, longtime costume designer who worked with Tarsim Singh and also worked on um, uh, the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula movie. Like mm. there, the, there are, costumes that exist in this movie for a second as part of a montage of different photography sessions and different magazine shoots. There are entire scenes that exist only through like CCTV and like um, control booth cameras as people are like doing these elaborate interviews and things. It is, it is an aggressively beautiful film. And Tori, I want to go to, to, talk a little bit about that for you, because I, I imagine like Donato and I are coming off this super fresh. We both watched this for the first time within the last 24 hours. You, It must have been the same thing for you the first time you saw this movie and we're like, holy shit, this is pretty. Yeah, I mean, I when I saw um, Promising Young Woman, I'm pretty sure my review was just like, this movie looks like bubblegum. And that's like kind of how I feel about this movie, too, where it. I feel like at least is kind of a horror movie, but is just so gorgeous to look at. And Mm -hmm. I assume that's because the director was like a fashion photographer specifically. So there is just so much like beautiful fashion embedded into it. But then we're also dealing with like really horrific themes and talking about, you know, beauty and ugliness and, you know, what it means to like be an idol and exist in this world and all of these different themes. So 
being able to like deal with all of that, but then the whole time just be like, God, every frame of this is gorgeous. It's just such a delight. Um, And watching it a second time around, I felt like I was able to appreciate that even more where I was like, wow, like not a scene like goes to waste. There's always like some pop of color or some like beautiful like background image or lighting that you can like gravitate towards. And you talked about in earlier, you were talking about how a lot of your writing kind of deals with um, irredeemable female characters. You also talked a lot about how uh, your writing deals with like sexuality and queer horror as well. This is unquestionably the horniest movie we've ever had on the show, like <laughs> by by a magnitude of a hundred, like it's not even fucking close. So talk a little bit about sexuality in this movie, because like, I don't want to just repeat that it's the horny, one of the horniest movies I've ever seen, but I don't really feel like I have a better way of putting it right now. So I'm going to put you on the spot and make you say something smart. So I don't just sound like I'm, you know, I'm going to go through and flabbergasted by, by all the sex scenes in this movie. That's really funny because I went through a period of watching movies this summer where the only thing I could describe them as were all dark and horny movies. They were all Mm. deeply depressing, but everyone was super horny and there was tons of sex scenes in them. And so this like kind of aligned with this weird just rabbit hole of movies I went with. Um, But yeah, I mean, Lilico is such an interesting character. I even have a Lilico necklace on right now uh, because I there is a jeweler I love who just happened to make a Helter Skelter necklace and I needed to own it. Can um, we, can we pause for folks at home? I just leaning forward a little bit. Oh, it's, it's the, and it's the shot too. Yep. Yeah, okay. it's the shot. You can't see this, but trust us. It's incredible. Please continue. <laughs> so I love Lilico. I love irredeemable women. Um, and I think a lot of that just has to do like thinking about societal norms for women anyway. And mm-hmm. it feels like the most rebellious act a woman can do is be evil and irredeemable. Uh, and that is cool as shit. I love it. Anytime I see it in a movie where I'm like, hell yeah, there is nothing you should like about her, but that makes me love her. (laughs) But then it also does delve into, you know, she is that way because there is also a lot of trauma that like she Mm -hmm. has been like in this business since she, it seems like uh, since she was like a young idol, which um, I did a little bit of research on the actress and she has a very similar background to Lilico, mm-hmm. which is also really interesting, uh, where she was just this like teen idol who um, eventually, because she didn't want to act the way idols are supposed to act, gets like shadow banned kind of. She like doesn't work for several years. Um, and this is the big movie that she like comes back with when she starts a production company. So I I kind of just find all of that interesting, too, and especially just how women are supposed to present, um, especially in a field where she is literally just hired because she is really good looking. And even that's a facade because all of that is plastic surgery. Um, so there is isn't a lot about Lilico that is real. Uh, and I find that to be one of the most interesting elements of the film, because even watching it a second time around, I, I still don't know if I totally understand Lilico or why she does the things she does um, mm-hmm. by the end of the movie. Well, it is. I mean, it's based on a manga, which I assume none of us have read, um, though I would be very interested in, in seeking out, actually. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about, you know, the different kind of threads and representation um, of bad women through history that kind of pop up here. It's worth noting that this is this feels like a pretty overt play on the Snow White uh, fairy tale as well, because there's there's even a very explicit scene where Lilico looks in the mirror and says, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest <laughs> of them all. And she is going through a her own like, uh, I don't remember the name of the queen in that one, but um, she's going through that whole scenario as well, where like she's been replaced by a younger, more pretty one. And like she's destroying her kingdom in order to take the heart and the power of this, you know, like it, it's. It's there's so much going on in this movie and it's drawing on so many interesting source drawing on so many interesting things for inspiration. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shook. This is one of the best shows we our best movies we've had on the podcast ever. So I'm just going to let it simmer for a little bit and let you two talk. Yeah. I'm I, trying. <laughs> oh no. I was just going to say too. I, one of the reasons I think Lilico is really interesting is also because like nothing is really hers. Like nothing about her is like, something that belongs to her. I think like at the beginning, her agent even says like the only thing that's real is like her pussy and something else. Like those are the only parts of her that are actually part of herself. Um, teeth, teeth, toenails. Teeth, yeah. I teeth, think teeth toenails. and toenails were in there too. Yep. Um, but 
you know, you find out as the movie goes on, we can do some spoilers, right? That's that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, that she is like all the plastic surgery that happened to her was based on the look of her agent. Um, so like, that's what her agent looked like when she was young. So her whole look doesn't belong to her. That's something that's manufactured. Even her makeup artist says something like, oh, like she, um, she's like my greatest work of art. So like, even the way like she looks in all of these photos and like poses, that isn't even because of her. It's credited to someone else. Um, Mm -hmm. Her assistant's like, oh, she can't live without me. So there's just nothing about her that feels like it belongs to her. And I mean, that kind of also makes me be like, yeah, so no wonder you're like a totally fucked up, terrible person. You've never had anything of your own. So that's that's just how you're socialized. Yep. Well, and that's the whole thing about like the beauty aspect of it all and like the beauty industry and what we do to women uh, who get involved and, or you know, any actor who gets or uh, sorry, model that gets involved. And it is about, you know, it's about the person and they become beautiful and then they have to deal with that in a way. But it's never about them actually like it's about everyone else changing them to be what they want and this view of perfection and how the character has to wrestle with that um i'm thinking about i'm trying like i've been like going through my phone trying to find a movie because i saw a movie at fantasia that does it really well where um somebody else gets this like experimental skin transplant and she's beautiful finally and how you know how that affects her i believe also the sosis the soska sisters rabid remake which i do not like but it does play with that as well in the same vein. Um, it To me, you know, talking about irredeemable women, it, like it almost, to me, like, I don't know, the ending almost redeems her in a way. And I, I don't know if that's okay to say, but like she finally takes, takes everything back. And her act of cutting her eye out and becoming famous again on her own terms to me is such a fuck you to everyone. Because, like, that moment, like, it's exactly that. She said, fuck you to everyone who has told her how to be famous and, like, what they did to her and corrupted her. And, yes, did she sick her assistant on other people to, like, try and kill them? Yeah, of course. That happened. Sure. But was that still all a byproduct of her trying to remain in the spotlight and remain in that fame because that's all she knows at that point? Like, I don't know. I think there is – I almost feel weird saying there's power in her final move. But I think there is there is power in her final mm-hmm. move in the way that she takes away her own beauty, quote unquote, but then becomes beautiful in a different way because she takes her eye out and becomes this weird performer. <laughs> eye patches well, are hot. There's this great, great quote at the beginning by the cop that is like looking into her case so they can they're trying to like discover what the plastic surgery place is actually up to and he just says stardom is a deformity like cancer and it feels like that end ties in really well with like her like you know stabbing herself or cutting out her eyeball or whatever is like her kind of taking out the tumor and be becoming healthy or something different i don't know what it is but i also think there's kind of speaking about like the fairy tale like mythology aspect of it too like she does become something more than human after that too. Like the way the girls talk about her is really interesting where they're like, Oh, I put a picture of Lilico under my bed. And so that way I, when I wake up, I won't have zits. And so she's almost like this piece of urban legend now. Mm -hmm. Um, And because of that is able to like exist on her own terms because she is no longer this like idol that has to live to these standards. And that's, that's something that I love about this movie. I like that you brought up um, the cop or the prosecutor. I could, I could never figure out if he was a cop yeah. or like a, a district attorney equivalent or, or what his role was. But um, I would love to get your insight into that, Tori, because I think that, that that character is is the narrator for all intents and purposes. And sort of in a film that is directed by a woman and the main characters, both good and less good, are female characters. It's interesting and I, I don't think I formed an opinion on it, but it's interesting to have sort of like the editorializing of the movie itself coming from like this totally detached, like hard boiled um, law enforcement type who's basically like all these women are broken and da, 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 da. And to talk about the ending, it almost sort of seems to pull the rug out from him in the very end that he like all the stuff that he's been saying the entire movie long, it sort of feels like it's almost sort of like, yeah, that was bullshit. She's fine. She's doing her own thing. Right. That like he thinks he has it figured out. So I was curious how that, especially in a second watch, how that character and the cutaways to that character read for you. Yeah. It's interesting because 
he does speak about her in this detached way, but at the same time, there is something about the way he speaks about her that is very romantic. And mm-hmm. even like even when they have that encounter in the aquarium, that scene feels very romantic. Um, even though he's like trying to question her and kind of like get her to um, testify for them for this case that they're trying to put together, the way he's speaking to her is so interesting because it seems like there is a part of him that is actually interested in her as a person and this thing that she has become. And maybe that's simply because as a man of the law, he has no like investment or interested in this like pop idol kind of culture. That's uh, so prevalent throughout the movie. Um, But then he also is able to just like talk down to her and like kind of like talk to her one-on-one which I guess he's the only person that kind of treats her like she's human. Um, But you're right. The fact that he is male and then also this like representing law enforcement is really interesting too. And you're right. I don't know if I like have totally figured out exactly how I feel about him, but as, as someone that is helping us like navigate the plot of the story, he's like Mm -hmm. a very interesting and useful character. Yeah. It's the read that I have on him. It was sort of there. There's a, he's either the most empathetic person that she encounters kind of on her journeys or the, the, the one that sees her for who she really is. Or there's also like a read that basically he's just exploiting her to a different means and he's just mm-hmm. doing it in like a more philosophical way. Um, and that her final chess move in the very end, like it throws him out as much as it throws her, you know, her ex boss. It's, it's beautiful and it's smart too. And like, there's just, there's so much going on here that I, I don't often rewatch certified forgotten titles just because we have a steady stream of these that are coming in. Uh, I think I'm probably going to rewatch this sometime soon. Like I really, I really feel the need to go back in and dive in a little bit. This feels like a movie one could get a little obsessed with as, as I say to you while you're wearing, you know, the actual (laughs) necklace. I mean, she's just, uh, she's, such an interesting character and it also being like a female directed film and one that has ties to the actress's real life for all things I find really interesting, especially just like knowing like a tiny bit about like the Japanese and Korean like idol like phenomena and how like they are supposed to like live these like really specific kind of lifestyles and Mm -hmm. even more so than here where like like my sister is really obsessed with uh like bts and it was a big deal when they each got their own instagram account like oh they were able to like just post pictures on their own without their agency needing to handle those things and so that was such a big deal and so looking at these people whose lives are so controlled in this really specific way, um, especially as a woman just adds all these like really interesting layers to the overall story um, and kind of makes like her lashing out and being just a fucking terrible person all kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you become a normal, well-adjusted person in that line of work. Yeah, I mean, one of my, you know, one of my favorite bands, I will honestly say this out loud, is like baby metal. And they are, you know, an Asian pop band, or sorry, an Asian metal band. And the way that they describe it is that the girls who front the band are all young girls. And that's the, the catch. It's like hardcore metal in the background, but then these cute little girls singing and dancing about chocolate. And like, It is exactly as sold, but you hear the stories about like, yes, those girls were all trained to be like Mm -hmm. lead singers. That is what they like set their sights on. And there were a bunch of other girls that were vying to be the lead singers as well. These three get chosen. And then there's the talk about like, well, yeah, then they're going to age out and like they'll have to figure out what to do for men because obviously they can't be in the spotlight anymore when they get too old. And that's kind of, you know, everything that's like, like that's what they're fighting here. Like that's what the models are fighting for here. It's the replacement idea. Um, the movie, by the way, that I was trying to think of is called Replace, and it also co-stars Bar- oh. Barbara Crampton, but it's a cool little indie about a woman who uh, basically her skin is cracking and drying, and she finds out that she can replace that with someone else's skin, and things get wild. But like that's, that, that idea of replacing and the idea of like, you know, fading out of the spotlight obviously happens here because you have the very famous, uh, you know, model that has competition eventually and how that gets handled. And like, it's all so intense and yes, it is vastly more intense and, you know, 
the Japanese Korean culture especially puts so much on the idolization, the celebrity status of everything that like you understand where this is coming from on every side, but also like the thing about the way this looks again as like a you know Japanese or Korean films as well really delve into excess and extremes and yeah. I think that's what puts Helter Skelter apart because any film about a model or actress some kind of celebrity that wants to retain that spotlight and will do anything to do it they kind of look the same in a lot of lights except this one is with having so much ties to the uh, photography background and like you know being made by someone with in doing beauty photography it translates so well to the screen just like we talk about music video directors transit transitioning to you know feature films and it's like well you can tell because these movies had a lot have a lot of movement adrenaline mm -hmm. excitement like you know short bursts well all that translates here for the same aspect of like photography because every shot is just so stunning and i think that's what puts Helter skelter like above all those other films where yes the model is going to do whatever it takes well yeah the model does whatever it takes it here but it's fucking stunning like that's that's the biggest differentiation what you were talking about too reminds me of uh, another movie i really love that i saw this year which is perfect blue um which is all about an idol who is having an identity crisis because she is like having trouble like like figuring out like who she is like detached from this idol persona and then Lilico is so interesting because it seems like she is only this persona there is really no other Lilico outside of her being famous and so that is actually terrifying because if she ages out if she's no longer beautiful if people decide to hate her there's nothing else that she can do or go back to it seems like she all of her money is tied to this agent that she is working with uh the boyfriend she has is like really flaky and like about to marry someone else so there is like no one that is actually there for Lilico uh to fall back on if the, this career doesn't work out yeah and we've talked a lot about the fact that this movie exists on the internet archive you know the last question we always like to ask our guests is sort of talking about where how does this film get its, its stay in court, right? Like, how does it find its audience? How does it become part of whatever cult canon it deserves to be part of? So I want to start um, by asking you that question, Tori. You're right. This is a remarkably good stream. This is as good a stream as I've seen from any movie anywhere on anything. Like, if you watch it, I don't know the legality of it. I don't know if it's super legal that it's on the Internet Archive, but whatever it is, that's where it is. And if you watch it, you're not going to miss out on anything. How does this film get back into the kind of conversations it deserves to be in going forward. I mean, it's so easy to see this movie as something that people like become obsessed with uh, if they have access to it. Um, and, you know, being like someone that collects tons of physical media, if like one of these bigger names like Severin or uh, Vinegar Syndrome or something like came out with like a really beautiful Blu-ray release of this movie, like there is no way that it wouldn't sell really well, um, both for people that like love it and have seen it somehow or people who are just interested because of the status it has. Um, and so I feel like I want to see these movies become more accessible just because I, you know, I want to, I'm sure there's tons of movies like Helter Skelter that are just inaccessible to me because of where I am right now, including other films by this director, um, mm -hmm. which all seem to have very similar gorgeous looks to them that are just not easy to find. Um, and so I feel like it is like so close to being accessible and part of the conversation now, um, but it just doesn't have like the distribution around it, which is unfortunate. Cause I think, I think she even won the lead actress won like the Japanese Oscar mm -hmm. for her performance in it. So there's, this is clearly a renowned film um, and it doesn't make a ton of sense why it isn't more available. Yeah, I agree. Donato, how do we save this movie? I mean, that's the thing. Like, how, how do you save it? How do you get it? U.S. distribution. That's the first actual question because looking everywhere i've just looked pre-podcast and now just to make sure it's never gotten a u.s release like there's nothing outside of uh, i believe you know there are some japanese market releases i believe it went to china it looks like uh korea but there's nothing or south korea sorry but it looks like there is uh nothing outside of that it played a u.s festival uh the new york asian film festival showed it in 2013 and then nothing so like the first 
actual answer here is the same one that we talked about when we did it comes because well first it, ha- it has to come out like everyone in america doesn't know about this movie because it only exists mm-hmm. on the archive.org because it never even came out here so it just has to be the answer lies in distribution the answer lies in the messiness of all these international rights uh the answer lies in reviews i have sitting from fantasia film festivals of like five six years ago that never came out because they were like japanese movies one was called like scream punk i can't even i can't hear you or something like that like some insane title and it was a movie i adored because it's about a singer finding her voice from a metal singer but also like they're being chased by I, i don't know they're being chased by like an underground syndicate it's insane and it's so much fun And it's the same conversation because it never got U.S. distro. And it's a movie I would love to champion and show people and be like, yo, you got to watch this. But there is no way to do it. So we have to bridge the gap between international and domestic, somehow get better distribution. But I say that already being incredibly overwhelmed by all of the choices I have on a weekly basis on horror alone. So it's like, yeah, it's messy. It's messy. It's crazy. Uh, but you know, I mean, something like RRR, even to bring that up and just to be like, yeah. that barely got a distro until like the memification of RRR gave it the release it's had, but even that's been a rolling road show. Like, did it even mm-hmm. get a wide release to say it, it, it's all there. We have this conversation every episode, but this is one of those yeah. it's cut and dry because just distribute it, but it's also not cut and dry because neither none of us would understand the legality and the red tape behind releasing a movie like this and well there's a reason that a movie that made 24 million us in japan never came out in the us and it ain't because it wouldn't have made money it proved it did but yeah especially when you see how well like south korean movies are doing mm-hmm. like in the us market now with like park chan wook and um bong joon ho like coming over here and making tons of movies like it just There is no way it wouldn't do well. So it's, but yeah, I I don't understand legal stuff. I didn't go to law school on purpose. So (laughs) it can happen. It can happen. We saw uh, Brad Henderson brought Norway to his episode of Certified Mm -hmm. Forgotten. And that is only because Brad Henderson, uh, you know, Vinegar Syndrome and also like has his own sub label television now, took this movie from Fantastic Fest 2014, had no distro up until last year. And he's like, well, guess I'm going to do it. And that's what it takes. It takes that person. It takes that influence to say people have to see this movie and god bless henderson having the ability to do that and having the means because we know there are people on the front lines actually advocating for these lesser known movies we have to hope someone does that for helter skelter which is still sitting out there waiting for a proper u.s release and the only thing i'll add to that is that we talk about this sometimes i think this is another example of the um the white hat seo effect i think this is a movie that should start as people begin to see it, I think this is a movie that should end up on a lot of lists about whether it's underseen Japanese genre film or I think films about fame, right? Like I would put this against the Neon Demon for sure, A Star is Born in terms of like movies that talk about the dark side of fame. I think that this, if you put together a bunch of like movies like that and had this one on be on the list, this is the one that'll stand out to folks because they probably never heard of it. But I guarantee you in terms of quality, it belongs on those kind of lists. So multiplier effect. When it's easier to find and more people write about it, then it'll be even easier to find and et cetera, et cetera. We just it did just show up. Letterbox showed like their top however many like female directed movies. And it was like number four or five on there. So it's like there's clearly people watching this movie that love it. So yeah. Letterbox come through. I love you yeah. guys. You're doing the Lord's work over there. Mm-hmm. All right. That is our final word on Helter Skelter. Go watch it on the Internet Archive while you can. I swear to God, it's one of the best shows we ever, or one of the best movies we ever talked about on the show. So, Tori, I want to say thank you so much for being our guest. Um, if people would like to continue to read your writing, if they'd like cryptic tweets about your book as you're working on it, maybe <laughs> things of that nature, where should folks go to follow you? 
I'm sure if people guess, they could figure out what I'm trying to write about. So, um, so I'm the Neon Banshee on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I write for Movie John, so I have stuff up there, at least like three or four things uh, a month, probably, including my Women Who Kill column, which should be coming out pretty soon. Uh, and I also just had a personal essay published in Hear a Scream Volume 2, which is now available on Amazon. So if you want to check that out, uh, I wrote a personal essay along with like some other really amazing voices in the horror community. So uh, those are all things to look for. Awesome. Donato, what are you up to and how do folks follow you? At Donato Bomb on Twitter, Letterboxd, and Instagram. Uh, what am I I'm just up to the regular stuff? Uh, monthly column on Bloody Disgusting. Lots of, inter- uh, lots of reviews on IGN and Paste and Slash Film. Festival coverage is probably going to come up because who knows, like Sundance is around the corner. So at Donato Bomb, follow me. Also find me on Authory, which is a wonderful thing every freelance writer should use and uh, people should follow. As for me, you can follow my verified Twitter account at at not Elon Musk. Uh, you can, no, that's, <laughs> that's a joke. That would get me kicked off. I don't want to be kicked off Twitter. I'm right into the end. Whatever, Matt Monagle, that's everywhere. What you should do though, is you should go and make sure that you check out certifiedforgotten.com. We've published some of my favorite writing of this year in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's just, there's so much good stuff up there. You should definitely go check it out. We're so glad to have the writers that we do. And if you liked this episode, um, you should, Tori was an amazing guest. You should also go check out some of our backlog of stuff that we've done up too. We've got a lot of really good, um, just incredible conversations, especially about Japanese film. Go, you know, go talk about, uh, what is it? Um, wild zero start with wild zero. I feel like you'll have a really good time. If you make that one of the first other episodes you listen to. There's something for everybody in the Certified Forgotten Backlog. Dory, we want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll hope to have you back again soon. And I think Donato's going to say something weird to take us out, like he normally does. Beauty Ice Bars. Beauty Ice Bars.